if you're only doing like really specific patterns in order, then when you go and play, your tendency will be to play in that order. So you got to kind of scramble it up. Today in the kitchen, we have our special guest, Chris Dingman. Everybody give it up for Chris Dingman. <laughs> Chris Dingman is an American jazz saxophonist and composer. He came to wide prominence in the late 1950s as a member of and eventually primary composer for Art Blakey's Jazz Messengers. In the 1960s, he went on to join Miles Davis' second great quintet. And hey, man, I'm gonna have to stop you right there. That's actually Wayne Shorter's bio. Wrong window. Uh, hold on. Chris Ding. Chris Dingman is a vibraphonist and composer. This is the one. That's me. Uh, for He's known for his distinctive approach to the instrument, sonically rich and con conceptually expansive, bringing listeners on a journey to a beautiful, transcendent place. He has been profiled by NPR, The New York Times, Drum Magazine, and many other publications. Now he is in John's kitchen and his own kitchen. Welcome, Chris Dingman. If I can come up with more ways of not going nuts, I'll share them with you. I only have one hippopotamus in my house. Did you just re release a record? I did. Well, it <laughs> came out March 6th. It's called Embrace. Today we have Chris Dingman on the show. <laughs> oh, welcome to the kitchen, Chris. Uh, Chris's new re release, Embrace, is coming at you. Do you want to play something or not really? Different things. Give it up for Chris Dingman. <laughs> you got your vibraphone there. Play? Just play. play. Here, I'll Okay. Anyway, so I don't have a motor on this instrument right now. And so it'll just be flat, flat vibes.
of all. So you you have a lot together, obviously, but maybe talking to some of the folks who don't who who would play vibraphone but feel like um, they they're not as free as as you are. Uh, what are maybe would you have any advice for? Okay, you're at your instrument. What do you do to start playing? What do you do? Yeah, that's. I mean, that's the big question. Um, that I probably asked myself about 10 times uh, or more during that improvisation. <laughs> but I think the ultimate answer comes from somewhere deeper inside. Uh, and maybe that's not the answer you're looking for, but th there's that, there's the sort of like tapping into like what's, what's coming to you, like what's speaking to you musically. And then there's also just the, you know, technical things to do to like be ready for when that call comes. In in terms of like what I was just doing, maybe there's a few things to unpack. Uh, they're kind of more obvious that, so one thing was like, I used a lot of this particular combo of mallets that um, I wouldn't encourage anyone else to do because then it would steal my thing, but um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But, uh, but, uh, it's, you know, there's the mallet combos. So I, I kind of like messing around with those. That's sort of been like an interesting chordal. Sorry, would you mean like harder and softer or the order that you're playing? So I mean the order. So like, you know, this would be like, well, do you call this number one? I, I don't call it any, I, the low one. I don't know. Yeah. yeah like, you know, like, in, like you can go or, but you, those are obvious, right? A little more obvious anyway it takes some practice to do that but um but then you could be like and so on there's a look there's permutations of course of that um that gets old after a while because there's only four and then it kind of goes away but then you could have these i think of them as like compound mallet combos where you have like a group of six, say, and it goes like, um, or so I think that was the one I was using a lot in this particular improv. So it's that bottom top or whatever, or then there's groups of five. And of course, there's like combining, you know, doubles of one hand. And so you can kind of come up with different grooves out of those and move between them, get comfortable moving between them in a way that, you know, leads somewhere. It's funny, like at 145 today or something like that there was a live stream from the percussive art society going through what you did but in a sequential way which i think what you said earlier i have now i'm in trouble with the editing but um uh well, you hit on with this idea of what you practice, the way you play it will come out later if you're gonna improvise, probably. Um, that makes a lot of sense to me because how you just presented those, if we went through a permutation, the thing is that most of us don't have the kind of um, attention to do that. And if we, so what we end up doing is one through five and skipping five through 7,000. Um, and so, I, don't know, I appreciate that. I I think it came it comes across the that you the result is that you uh, you're free and not bound to one four five or one two three or whatever it is. Um, totally. Mm -hmm. um, it really takes pre it's like starting the practice with the intention of like okay, well I'm going to pick this up and then I'm going to use it in my own way as my own tool in some other context. And if you have that in mind, like you're going to practice it in a different way than if you were like, okay, I've just got to get this really down. And that's, you know, and that's it. Um, I was 
I had this one night last summer that I wrote all this, all these words, sort of free associated, all these words. Um, and I've been setting that to music. So I've been basically writing these kind of songs. And I've been playing them with this quartet with um, a great young singer named Miriam L. Hodgley. She's sort of like my partner in that, and she's been learning the songs, and she's awesome. And, and that's, I have more to do with that, but I just haven't, it's, but that's gotten crowded out by like putting out the trio album. And, I'm even, I'm curious, even in, in, in because we can, we're, we're vibing in the kitchen here, um, the, the influence of younger, you're already over the top. <laughs> Or over the hill, and, you know. Like, forget about Milk Jackson. Harry Gary Burton's like now a thing where in ten years it'll be like you, you got to check out this guy. And, oh, really, I never heard of him. Um, whereas now you have people in their twenties kind of trailblazing it with influence. I think. Am I? Am I wrong? Well, it's kind of how the world of jazz has worked for a long time. Like the album Blue Train. A pretty pretty well regarded album is like one of the classic jazz albums. I think everyone in the band is like under the age of twenty five, um, and like Lee Morgan was eighteen, I think, when he recorded on there. I could be off by a couple of years, but I mean the point's still the same. Like everyone's really young on these albums that we think of as you know like legendary albums. Interesting. And like everyone, everyone's like learning from those things so I, I don't know how much eight you know it doesn't have to be like a thing where you have to get to be 40 years old to be an authority um it just could be anything i mean and also the on the other end of it like i heard that west montgomery was like 39 when he started playing or something like that wow i could be wrong that could that could be some nasty rumor but um yeah I think there's there's a big variety and it's less about that and more about just wherever someone's at at the particular time and how it relates to other music that's happening. Nowadays it's so like there's such a big variety of music that's considered jazz yeah. that it's kind of hard to like define it um, very well, you know, I think yeah. that's, and define like who's the who's a forerunner, who's sort of like, who's the person who's like the authority or anything like that. It's, it's getting harder and harder, I think, to, to point to any one person or one set of people. What do you, if you're listening to anything, what are you listening to? And in, in recent years, I've gotten very into like uh, Malian Kora music as a big inspiration and also just as music that I love to listen to. And it's kind of similar, but I also really love the um, the santur. I guess it's these sort of plucky, hitty string instruments that I'm into hmm. for some reason. If, there, if I was going to name an instrument that I'm particularly, you know, enjoying listening to. But, but in general, I, I've been listening to a lot of like, I've found that, yeah, a lot of Indian classical music is calming me down lately. <laughs> So I've been listening to that and some some jazz albums for sure. Been sort of like cathartic to listen to. Some Herbie Hancock stuff. Someone posted this. It was Herbie Hancock's birthday recently, and I think that's why it's on my brain, but um, it was his 80th birthday. So someone posted this version of um, 
Uh, it's this tune called Mimosa, I think. It's from Inventions and Dimensions. It's kind of an older Ruby Hancock album. Well, they posted the album. It wasn't like him playing at the Kennedy Center last year or doing some... Um... I mean, Herbie, like these guys are so interesting to me. The long game of the or the Wayne Short or Herbie Hancock and and um, people who played on an album when they were twenty three and now are eighty, and somehow still getting on the stage and maybe playing that same tune. Yeah, <laughs> it's like three times most of our ages are like who are who are most of the people who are going to listen to that. Do you want to play something or not really? That, forget, I mean, I'm always asking people who toured uh, two years on something. It's like, how do you, like the Broadway thing, how do you come to it again? Um, and, so crazy. you know, and, and usually it's insightful because I, I can't play the same thing twice. And, um, uh, but that's a fascinating, I mean, that's a very rare thing. You, I know you play with, uh, Tim plays the... He plays the uh, Camel and Goni. Do you want to play something or not really? We used to play in a group together called Motions that, where he would play Camel and Goni. This idea of, of playing choral lines on vibes or whatever it is, uh, is that something, you, you've done a fair amount of that. Do you want to play something or not really? Some, uh, yeah, a little bit. And then do you do you then develop it into vibe language or do you just copy and paste? Uh, it's definitely not copy and paste because it's almost impossible. <laughs> uh, a lot of the chorus stuff, it's just, it's so many layers that like there's no way that it can be done on vibe. So it's a lot of ad adaptation and just like, also like what is it that's like the essence of it that, that makes me love this music so much and sort of getting at that more. But um, I did, you know, maybe an example is good. Is that what you're asking? Do you want to play something or not really? And my head's cut off. Anyway. This is, that's the, it's not, we're not in the kitchen until somebody's head's cut off. <laughs> that's what happens in the kitchen. The pedal gets weird. Anyway. Okay, so here's an example of like, um, one part of a Quora thing that I tried messing around with. So it's from uh, Timani Di Abate. Uh, I think it's from his first album. Like it's a solo album called Kyra. And I think this is from a piece called Ala Ala Ke. Anyway, it goes like this. I just tried messing around because like he's got this pattern going. Um, but then there's like a melody that happens. And I can't do the melody because the melody sounds like this. Something like that. And I can't do that with one hand so well. So. Just like kind of how do you adapt it so that the vibes can do that a little bit. exercise in not being as good as a Cora, but you know, <laughs> it's, um, that's just, I would never like perform that. That's not part of a piece for me. That's just like an exercise of practice. You, you 
when you craft it like an ostinato, it's pretty inventive. Where most mallet players, if I could say, for you know, we see a lot on the internet, are doing like A, and whereas I see what you do, it's like Z. And so just having seen that example, I was like, oh, that's where he got, you know, <laughs> maybe a little bit of that. Um, uh, and I mean, that's not, I know because I've tried, that's not easy in the least bit to keep that uh, that part and, um, you know, the, the left hand situation. Yeah, it's painfully hard. And, and at first for a long time, it was just like, okay, can I go like this? the other hand like messing up yeah so that's just something that you would have played that was like for like your own curiosity yeah that was just for fun because i really love that piece and it was like a way that i could sort of play it not really did it then did you then cop that and say i'll do my version not version but maybe influenced is there something that because i don't know why wouldn't you play that out well, I just never got that far, and also I always felt like, well, that's not mine, you know. That's right. not um, that, you know. I would want to. I feel like I can't do that piece justice, really, um, and it's also not mine, so it's better not to play that. But maybe someday. Um, but but I did write a piece that is sort of still being written. I don't know. It's never been. It's only been performed live like once or twice. Um, and it's not even written down because there's not a lot to it. It's just got like an ostinato. It's very similar ostinato, but it's sort of, well, let me show you. It's a, using that and then there's like a melody that goes with it but... so that's part of a piece and i just remembered that that's actually not the beginning beginning is something like um geez, you know you gotta write these things down so there's that part and then there's a melody that goes on top of it that is i didn't prepare this for today so <laughs> starts with that and then it ends up in this kind of zone. So I sort of took that ostinato and made it part of it. I love that you you take the, this is the only example that I've seen, maybe I haven't seen a lot of things, but uh, of a of a idiomatic pattern that you've translated into a musical line. Most of us can't go, ooh, bah, ooh, 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 ooh. Uh, Bobby McFerrin, you know, could probably do it. But, but the fact, then you said, instead, like, that you're doing the, if I'm not mistaken, do, do, and then not doing this, but doing, right? You, because you said, uh, you need that top mallet to play the melody so that you don't break the pattern, but you do double the work, or, Two thirds more of the work in your left hand. I want to go like this, but so yeah, it was painful to first be like, okay, well, I need this mallet. So. 
I gotta do it like this. It's a lot for the left hand to do it. But it frees up a mallet to do something else. Right. Well, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody give it up for Chris Jigman in the kitchen. There's a baby in that drawer. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Cry for attention. She also did this with all her clothes, so that's fun. <laughs> for real? Oh, my God. 